Hi, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, Yahoo Finance is live streaming this as we're watching it, so people out in the internet world uh, are watching as well. Uh, let me introduce the two panelists we have here to talk about conscious capitalism. Brittany Underwood is founder and CEO of the Ecola Project. If you don't know what that is, you're about to learn. Next to her, Kip Tyndall, a co-founder and now chairman of the Container Store. Most of you have probably been there during disorganized moments of your life to get it all straightened out. Uh, I'm going to ask each of them just to talk just briefly about um, your company um, and what is conscious capitalism? How do you put this into practice? Brittany, go ahead. Um, so at Acola, we operate a social business, which is sort of a millennial variation of conscious capitalism, what Kip and his friend John Mackey, and um, who's the CEO of Whole Foods, and started Whole Foods and that whole group began. Um, a social business is an enterprise that seeks to empower disadvantaged communities through kind of business solutions. Um, and we do that at Acola through producing products that sell um, across the country in an elevated marketplace to give women opportunity um, both in East Africa and locally in Dallas. And so we have a jewelry company that actually um, has retailed in 450 stores nationwide. Um, all of our profits are reinvested in our social mission to empower women who can't get opportunity but need desperately to provide for their families. And what's neat about that um, is we've been able to create a pretty robust holistic development model um, that has a deep kind of participatory as well impact on women in poverty, um, as well as a product that has been able to retail I guess now in the luxury space. We're the first full impact brand to launch in the luxury space through Neiman Marcus this fall. Um, our products are in every store nationwide, thanks to Kip's friend, Karen Katz, um, the CEO of Neiman Marcus. And we are just a company that's excited to continue to drive the social business movement for millennials and continue to explore how we can use, again, the best of business to solve world problems. Brittany, what are the products? Products? Jewelry. So we mainly have jewelry and accessories. So I'm wearing one of our Neiman Marcus pieces right now that is actually um, raw materials are handcrafted by the women in our program in Uganda. And it's finished in one of our centers in Dallas, Texas that employs women in urban poverty. And you are a corporation, but you are structured as a nonprofit corporation. Is that right? Yeah, actually, we have the same organizational structure as Goodwill. So we're a nonprofit with a mission related enterprise. So we have a profitable business that's run through a nonprofit framework, but we're able to do that because our social mission aligns with our profits. Okay, Kip, uh, you probably don't have to describe to people what the container store is, but talk about your recent history. You went public uh, a couple of years ago. Uh, there different types of strains placed, uh, or demands, I guess you could say, placed on public companies. How can you be uh, a conscious capitalist when you have Wall Street analysts and shareholders breathing down your neck all the time? <laughs> Microphone. <laughs> Kip, I think you need the microphone. I'm used to a lavalier, sorry. <laughs> um, please redouble your efforts, and thank you. We, uh, um, you know, we're a little bit different than Brittany's marvelous company and that we're, um, you know, we're, we're kind of a, a traditional retailer, but we choose to behave um, in, in sort of a conscious capitalist servant leadership type model where we, where we basically um, um, don't just look at the shareholder, but we actually uh, try to optimize uh, all of the stakeholders, the shareholder, the employee, the, uh, the vendor, the community. Um, and you know we we we've really discovered that when you're when you're your banker's favorite customer when you're your vendor's uh, favorite customer uh, uh, being successful is easier when you're everybody's favorite uh, darling cute customer or little store or whatever than it is when they're laying awake at night trying to figure out how to get back at you and so it's um, uh, a public company of course uh, we we have uh, uh, Darden is here and other We've had the academic community kind of track those companies which are most conscious capitalists like Southwest Airlines, Whole Foods, the Container Store, Google. Um, uh, there's lots and lots of examples. And those companies uh, are not just doing it to be um, uh, socially mindful. Uh, it's actually a profit enterprise. And so it's a profit strategy. Uh, the most conscious capitalist companies on Wall Street have outperformed the S&P index 14 to 1 over the last... Um, over the last 15 years. And what we're discovering is that people are no longer skeptical that actually um, 
business does not have to be a zero-sum game. I'm, I'm good friends with the, the, uh, the founder of, of uh, Southwest Airlines, Herb Kelleher, and he told me about 35 years ago, Kip, you can build a better business on love than you can fear. And I thought, who in the heck is this guy? You know, talking about love and business and everything. But of course you can. Your employees never leave. They wake up. They look forward to coming to work in the morning. Um, um, someone once said that a, a, an employee, the first 25% of their productivity is mandatory. They have to do that or they'll get fired. But the next 75% of any employee anywhere's productivity is, is optional. They only do that depending on how much they love their boss and their product and their culture and that type of thing. So it really is a profit strategy. It enriches your life and the lives of the people that you do business with, but it also makes more money than, than, than doing it the other way. So the old top-down militaristic uh, uh, thing is not attracting the best talent anymore. Uh, uh, customers or even, even us baby boomers are starting to vote with our pocketbook a little bit. So it's both delightful and it's, and it's profitable. And uh, what I like, watch people like Brittany kind of take that and then form an organization like hers, uh, it's pretty great stuff. You can change the, the world and the world of business simultaneously. In fact, you can change the world more through, by changing business than you can through just by focusing solely on non nonprofit. Uh, and you can find more about uh, both of these um, panelists in your, uh, on the website or just do a web search for both of you. will find lots of information about them. So let me ask, uh, I'll, I'll just open this to both of you. Corporations are not popular right now. Uh, all the um, anxiety and anger we're seeing in the presidential campaign is driven by a lot of people who feel corporations are doing just fine, but they're not participating in the, uh, in the prosperity. Jobs are being sent overseas, and everybody knows the whole riff here. I'm not endorsing that view. I'm saying it's very tangible. A lot of people do feel that way. So how do you convince uh, business leaders uh, to care about people? That simply. Well, I think a great example, I mean, for us has been Kip and, um, you know, Karen Katz and John Mackey and sort of that generation that really led the charge and prioritized people as much as they prioritized profits and their product as well. And I think what's really interesting is seeing the partnerships that are now forming between organizations like the Container Store and social businesses run by millennials um, and Neiman Marcus, et cetera. You saw that with Tom Shoes. and all of the um, amazing impact they're a for-profit company, but they were able to have in the way they gave back. But I think there's also a lot of social enterprises emerging um, whose goal is their social mission. It's to uplift you know, men and women out of poverty through economic development. And they're partnering with corporations who are looking at their bottom line um, to do good. And so again, a great example is with our national launch through Neiman Marcus. I mean, our products are competing with Oscar De La Renta, David Yearman, I mean, and we are a social brand. Um, and so obviously the reason why Neiman's launched us nationally was because of our impact and because they want to have an impact and that they care. And I think there's, there's this movement towards products that make a difference. There's a movement towards conscious capitalism that takes care of, you know, and, and a culture that prioritizes the person, the employee. And millennials care about it, but every generation does. And I think companies that are more and more are starting to realize that and more partnerships are emerging to grow that in kind of new and creative ways. Well, you know, guy, mostly guys went off to World War II, and when they came back, they started businesses, and they adopted what they learned in the military to the running of those organizations. And that may be okay in the military, but that's a terrible way, really, to run a business. And so what's changing is the kind of not top-down militaristic style of, of, of running a business, uh, uh, servant leadership, which is pretty much what it sounds like, conscious capitalism. And those are, the, those are the companies that are beginning to dominate their niches. And the ones that kind of refuse to change are beginning to kind of diminish and not dominate their, their, their niches. And it's a, you know, it's, a, it's a great thing because business is just so much more gigantic than nonprofit. I mean, Kip, would you give us a couple examples where you see that happening? Well, I, I mentioned uh, Southwest Airlines, who I think's done, you know, uh, uh, probably better over over the years than than anybody in, uh, uh, in you know in the, in the airline uh, uh, industry. Uh, <clears throat> there's a little company in Dallas, Texas, called TD Industries, and it, they're they're the most uh, conscious capitalist uh, servant leadership company I've ever seen. They're a bunch of plumbers, right? Plumbers, and 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 so imagine teaching this sort of esoteric uh, 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 conscious leadership to a bunch of plumbers, but I mean. They, um, uh, they do better than anybody. Anytime a big project comes up in Dallas, uh, TD Industries uh, 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 does it. 
Uh, Google's a great example. I mean, Whole Foods has dominated their niche forever. Whole Foods is getting a lot of competition, uh, you know, right now as people adopt it, but that's just the price of that type of success. So I really believe, and more and more business leaders really believe, if all you want to do is make as much money as humanly possible, this is the best way to do it. And I, I think that, that, that Bill Clinton, no matter what, whether you like him or don't like him, he's running around basically giving a speech. Well, before the campaign, he was basically giving a speech that is um, nonprofits won't save the world, business will save the world, but uh, because they are so powerful and so big. And this type of blending uh, here, I think, really, really makes a difference. We have Fortune Magazine running around uh, saying that we're one of the best companies to work for in America. When we open in Cincinnati, we only hire 2% of the people that apply. Everybody wants to work for that company that's a great place to work for. Somebody gets the best price on every product from a vendor, and it's very often the container store because of the relationship and, and the way they approve of the way that we uh, do business. Most retailers have an adversarial relationship. This is the opposite of that. So. It's good, it changes the world, and it, uh, not always, but it tends to really enhance the profitability of the businesses that, that do this. Some do it more than others, but uh, everybody seems to be doing it more and more. Well, let me ask you guys to address that directly. So the impression is that in order to treat everybody better, uh, it's expensive, it costs more. Uh, and if you're paying people, if you're paying your, your employees more, well, by definition, it costs more which means you either have to be able to charge a higher price for a premium product that people are willing to spend extra for, or you have to cut costs someplace else. What's the, how do you make the math work? Well, just, just real simply, and then let Brittany answer that, uh, Costco is a great example. Costco pays almost double their average employee what their nearest competitor does. And Costco just beats the pants off that nearest competitor, you know, and so it's, it, they just, they, they're paying almost double for the same, uh, for the same worker, but they're actually, uh, 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 doing a lot better they're getting they're getting more than that 85 percent or so uh, productivity gain uh, by doing that yeah I would say that's really the case for social business because I think that there there are disadvantaged members of our community who just aren't market efficient like it's just not going to work um, it's going to take them longer to gain confidence in the work that they're doing you're starting kind of training you know, at a very basic level, sometimes with, with very little educational background, and, um, and and so it's not market efficient. And so I think that's why social businesses have, uh, and that whole movement that really started with Muhammad Yunus and his idea of social business, and has seen a lot of different forms with Tom's and Feed and Giving Keys and our project and um, other other businesses where you know employing disadvantaged community members is is the goal. And again, that's not very profitable. And so I think running that through different models, whether it's B Corp or whether it's a nonprofit, um, you're able to look at, at least in our organizational structure, the bottom line is our women. Um, we have to be profitable so we can get impact investments to scale at the scale we're, we're trying to go to. Um, and we have to run a great business. But in the end, our social services have to be supplemented by donations um, as well and we can't fund if we're which we were doing using all of our profits to fund our social programs we're not going to grow so there's this kind of hybrid approach that's needed and I think that's what's happening um, and you're seeing again more and more Millennials kind of gravitate towards that is um, using business models to solve problems and and kind of combining the best of nonprofit with the best of business solutions to um, to kind of tackle some of these challenges and then in partnership with places like the Container Store and Neiman Marcus, Whole Foods has a lot of these partnerships, um, having kind of the retailer that whose bottom line is their profits carry your product line so you can help more people. In case anybody's wondering if you can work for Brittany's company, I asked her this and she told me, um, well, yes, you could work for us if you were a woman and you lived in a disadvantaged area. So I can't. But maybe some of you. Can. <laughs> you could be on staff, but you couldn't be. <laughs> you couldn't. We uh, be we will rep. take questions from the audience in a couple minutes if you have one. So think one up, make it a good one. Um, I want to ask you guys both about what happens as you grow. Um, Kip, your company went public a couple years ago. Uh, you've struggled as a public company. Your stock is down, um, but you had to. You needed the capital because you were growing. Um, Brittany, you are. You're growing. You may need capital at some point. How do you? You may have to get that. Maybe you're already getting it from lenders who aren't going to loan it to you at two percent. They're going to want something better than that. So how do you work it out when you need capital and you need to promise a good return back? 
Well, there's been a lot of great conscious capitalist companies that are public. Uh, uh, we were talking before, uh, Han, uh, 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 being public has its charms. Uh, working with private equity people have their charms. Uh, I detect sarcasm uh, in that. We, Maybe we, I'm the we only actually one. Get, uh, we actually get both of those. And our stock, we came out at $18 at the IPO. It doubled, went to $36. It went to $48, at which time it was over 200 times PE ratio. Uh, it's it's still a very high PE, uh, PE ratio, but it's uh, Jim Senegal, who the Costco guy I alluded to earlier said, Kip, every great company three or four times a decade has their stock fall down more than half. And so um, that um, I've, I've been the darling of Wall Street and the dunce of Wall Street. It's more fun to be the darling. But, um, you know, we, we believe that actually um, uh, we've never felt better about the, the future of our business. Uh, we, we practice conscious capitalism, not quarterly capitalism. And uh, many of the things that we do at the container store uh, are, are rather long-term uh, oriented. And uh, uh, Brittany, I'll get to you in a sec, but I just want to follow up on that. Um, are analysts buying it? Um, are you convincing them to think about you differently than they might think about other companies? And are you be able to push back against whatever pressure they may be putting on you to cut costs and do other things like that? You know, when a, when a public company CEO says it's conscious capitalism, not quarterly capitalism, uh, you're still doing things, you know, you have an obligation to that shorter term shareholder as well. I mean, you're, you're spending a lot of time talking about medium and long term shareholding, and I really think that the short termism on Wall Street's a real problem, and there's a lot of people trying to uh, do something about that. I mean, a long term capital gain is one year. How about five years? How about 10 years? What if there was no tax on, on holding a, a stock for five years? Or, you know, there's a, there's a lot of people, you know, beginning to think like that. But, but we also have an obligation to, um, uh, and as a matter of survival, I mean, you must continue to make that short-term, you know, quarterly-oriented shareholder happy as well. Brittany, when you need to borrow money, how, what do you tell your lenders? Yeah, well, first of all, I have to brag on Kip. When, when they talk about a container store conscious capitalism, that extends even beyond their treatment of employees. It's how engaged they are in the community. And um, Kip's team redid our distribution center after one of the women in our program who had been formerly incarcerated for you know, 15 years and sexually trafficked and now is running our distribution center and is just so proud of it, realized we needed better containers and so Kip sent his head of um it's the key to everything <laughs> better containers she 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 heard we he, she heard we um, um, I met the man of the container store and, and what she heard was containers and we needed containers and so um Kip sent kind of his head of community relations to our store to meet with Annette who was so excited about containers and you know several weeks later ended up just pro bono kind of just making, creating this beautiful distribution center out of all of the wonderful containers at um, Container Store. And so Kip's mind's constantly on that. And I think that's why his company has been successful. I think that's why millennials look up to people like Kip Tendall and John Mackey and um, just kind of the trailblazers of this movement. Because it's not, it's not a strategy. And, and I think, again, in our generation, you can tell what's authentic and you can tell what's not. And you want to be part of something that's real and just their hearts. I mean, it's it's Kip's heart, it's John Mackey's heart to create change, and they care about profits, but they care about people just as much, and that shows in all the work they do. So I've been a beneficiary of that, and he means what he's saying. But um, but yeah, so when, how we scale, we've had to kind of create this innovative model to scale as a social business, because we've really wanted to stay under a nonprofit um, organizational structure so all of our profits can be reinvested in, in our social mission. And so we've had a lot of people say, gosh, this is growing, it's becoming really successful, you need to go, you can at least be a benefit corporation, you know, you need the capital to scale. And we've had absolutely no problem um, getting the capital we need, which has been qu quite a lot. I mean, even for our first Neiman Marcus order, we got an impact investment in the form of a low interest loan from a major foundation. Um, with like 0.001% interest, which was so you did get that super. To, to, super we did to finance our product line, and then now we need a close to two million dollars worth of um, growth capital to be able to build capacity to kind of so we can open up opportunity with other national department stores, and um, we have a major foundation interested in half of that, and a major bank, and actually out of their kind of philanthropic social investment fund, um, they're giving us incredible rates so we can scale and grow and continue to be a nonprofit oh, and do the work model. we're doing. Um, so yeah. Who has a question? Uh, I will go all the way in the back. Do we have microphones? Great. Uh, first of all, uh, remarkable, two remarkable stories, uh, which we should
Portugal, thank you for. Uh, my question thank is, you. how do you, as founders and CEOs of, of uh, commercial enterprises, but perhaps with a, with a social um, purpose to them, prioritize the CEO decision making when you have to make a decision among your stakeholders? And the stakeholders could include your shareholders, your employees, your customers, and there could be a decision that would be adverse to one versus the other. That's a good question. Um, so I'm gonna take a question over here next, if we could move the microphone over. Right there, third row, I think. Go ahead, Kip. You expect us to be able to remember two at once? <laughs> yes, I do. <laughs> well, it's, it's um, uh, Ed Freeman at, at Darden uh, School of Business uh, is often thought of as the the father of the stakeholder model and he's he's one of these renaissance men that he, he's a great chef he's a he's a master musician you know he's a black belt in karate or something like that i mean he, he can do anything well but he uses the word harmonize the stakeholders you know you're I, I used to say balance he corrected me on that or optimize no it's harmonize this one might be a little lower in this arena that one's a little higher there so you get the privilege as management to try to harmonize all of that. It's, it's wonderful to have vendors love you. It's, it's fabulous to have employees love you. It's nice to have your bankers and lawyers love you. you know? And so how do you, how do you optimize the win-win and the win-win-wins? And it's, it's, it's highly situational. And I think you just said put the bankers and lawyers last. Yeah. <laughs> well, but, well, that's pretty cool if even the bankers and lawyers kind of get into your, you know, so. But, um, uh, the, you, you don't have to treat everybody the same to be equal. There's certain things that employees need. Uh, shareholders kind of get paid last, so we try to make sure that they that we remember that because you know the employees getting paid no matter what. There's time. It's um, it's it, it's a Rubik cube uh, type thing, but you know they can tell when you're knocking yourself out trying to optimize all of that simultaneously. And I think it's more fun than anything else in business, and it generally uh, results in a higher profitability than just kind of being. Uh, you know, unilaterally focused on, on one or the other. Yeah. You want to go add to that or go to the next question? Go to the next one. That's a great. Ahead. I don't know right if there. I can beat that. I was trying to keep it, my question in my head. <laughs> um, first of all, um, great message you have. And I like that you just said um, putting shareholders last. Is that what you well, said? No, they, they get, get they paid, get paid last. last. So if you remember that, right. that, that means that when you do pay them, you want to pay them very, very well because they patiently allowed the vendor and the employee and everybody else to get paid first. Right. So now we need to take care of them too, very well. Most companies, I think, think they get paid first. But anyway, um, but my question is in this vein, kind of related to what that gentleman said. One is, as a mother, a baby boomer mother of a millennial, she got that from somebody who cares about social responsibility. So it has been around for a long time. Um, and it's great to see all of this really coming, becoming more mainstream. But I'm curious how Kip, you, and, and both of you can, should weigh in, or would, I hope, how you balance kind of return on investment with um, tracking. How do you draw a direct correlation between what you're doing and sales or uh, revenue? Do you have data that you use to show your shareholders? Do you see where I'm going with that? Yeah, Brittany, why don't you feel that? Yeah, we, um, we do a social return on investment. So we have an SROI, and we actually worked with the business school at SMU to kind of do an independent SROI for our project. So it's looking at, in Dallas, our program, it's looking at taxpayer savings based on the programs we're doing. I mean, every area of our social impact. And so we're able to, when we go to again there's, there's been this big bang in philanthropy with with social investment and impact investing and um when we're able to go to social investors and say you know here's here's you know how we run our business here and here's our profitability but also here's our social return on investment and this is if you invest in us even if you're getting a very small return here's here's the return you're getting socially and it's it's much higher than almost any other non nonprofit i i know um it, it's it's tremendous, um, and so in calculating that, we're able to kind of track those key metrics and um, and, and give the social return on investment. But I know want to add Kip or move on? No, I mean you know we're 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 expected to. Uh, I mean what's good is 
20% even down, 20% growth. I mean, you know, it's pretty traditional stuff what people expect us to do. And so if you're going to pay your employees that well, if you're going to make your vendors love you, um, uh, how high is that gross margin because of that vendor relationship? You know, how, uh, how productive are those employees? So uh, we get measured pretty traditionally, and we just maintain that this approach uh, allows us um, uh, uh, to do better um, than, than, than we would otherwise. Over here. Hi, thank you so much. Uh, this has been really interesting. My question is for you, Brittany, and it's about the um, existing artisan community in Uganda. I'm wondering how you have managed to um, work in or around existing um, systems of entre or entrepreneurship, but also interns um, and individuals who might have a system in place where they're already training people to create jewelry and things like that. Are they? Are you? wound up in that system, or are you bringing in outsiders to uh, sort of supplement? Yeah, so I started working in Uganda about 12 years ago, so it was actually before the social business movement emerged and right as kind of the fair trade movement was gaining a lot of momentum. And so in Uganda, there were, you know, small artisan groups, but I actually went in through the nonprofit side. So I was working on um, working with disadvantaged children and sort of the orphanage system and realized pretty quickly there's got to be a more sustainable way to solve the, this problem, and and we realized it's through women. Why why aren't women being empowered to take care of the kids in their own home? Why where are they going to orphanages? There's a system for disadvantaged kids in the community, and it starts with the household. So we thought, if how how can we help women generate income um, so they can take care of their kids, and and that's what started Acola. And so we built our business off of um, working in these rural communities and wanting to offer specific women opportunity who were not connected to the global marketplace, subsistence farmers who didn't own their own land, HIV positive, highly marginalized, not artisans, and, and very little educational background. So we actually trained them to make products that sold in the global marketplace. And um, we're able to build our own facilities and own our entire manufacturing process, everything from hand carving anacoli cow horn to you know, making, hand making beads, casting, and um, assembling products and jewelry. And so we, um, we've actually been able to work with a lot of great artisan groups in other countries by sourcing some raw materials that we can't produce through our women in our program. And so we work outside of Kibera Slum in Kenya and source some of our bone from there. We work in Ghana with the glass that is even incorporated in our Neiman Marcus jewelry collection. And our real goal is for every raw material, much less the assembly, to have an impact, right? Um, and then we, we give women a living wage through our um, assembly programs as they make the jewelry. It's $15 an hour in Dallas, um, which is really great, and that helps them move out of poverty and then our distribution centers even run as a second chance job program so we've tried to build this model where it's integrating um, different artisan groups that already exist in, in different parts of all around the continent of Africa um, but also building our own um, systems for creating a full impact and fully ethical supply chain we're almost out of time I want to ask both of you um, about starting a business these days so a lot of people want to start a business they find it daunting, though. You, they think they have to be based in Silicon Valley and get a million dollars in venture funding. Uh, they hear about all these onerous licensing re restrictions and how all these rules and regulations just strangle businesses these days. So if you're thinking specifically about young people, millennials, which we've mentioned, what are the most tangible tips, one or two or three, you could offer somebody who wants to start a business? <laughs> you know much more about this than I do. I'm only 12 years in. Um, I guess my tips are, especially in this kind of work, is um, just not letting failure stop you. I mean, we've failed, especially operating um, when I was working sort of in that orphanage model, just made a lot of mistakes and probably did more harm than help for the first five years I was living in Uganda. And um, my, my greatest encouragement is to not give up when you make mistakes and you fail, but kind of learn from them and actually create a better model, a better business. What kept you going well. when you failed? I, I think sheer perseverance and the fact that I knew these women. I, I lived next to them. I knew their families and I knew the consequences of giving up and that, um, that helped me persevere. It's just my passion for those communities. and. So I would say perseverance and ability to kind of learn from failure, not be afraid of it, um, and just determination, just to overcome. Kip, how do you start a business these days? 
Well, um, you know, we did it uh, with a whopping $35,000 in capital and started small, one tiny little 1,600 square foot store in Dallas, Texas. Um, um, and then we just kept conservatively growing it and growing it and growing it. And, um, you know, you, um, I think being an entrepreneur is so great. I mean, I, I think some wise person once said, blur the distinction between work and play. When, when Claude Monet was painting the water lilies, was he working or playing? He was doing what he wanted to do. And so, you know, you're able to get really good at something because it's about all you do. Your friends find you kind of one-dimensional, you know. But um, I, I think it's, uh, it's good to think about that fact that, uh, you know, your, your vendors become your vacation mates and you create the world's best shoebox while you're on, you know, vacation. And, and that's not working. That's, that's blurring the distinction between work and play. And it is a lot, a lot like Monet painting those water lilies. And, and so I, I also did it with my wife, Sharon Tyndall, who's the chief merchant of the company. So we've been able to do this together. Now, real quickly, I just stepped down a couple of months ago as chairman and CEO. I'm, I'm, I'm chairman. I'm no longer CEO after all these years. And my dear friend and colleague, Melissa Reif, who's our president, um, and she's always wanted to be CEO, and she's only a year younger than me, so I'm going to wait till she's 100 to let her be CEO, and, and so she really wants to do that. And so I, I'm not bragging, but I probably have worked like 14 or 15 hours a day for 38 years building the container store, and now I'm expected to work like 15 hours a week. And <laughs> what I've discovered is I don't care how much you love your work, 15 hours a week beats the heck out of 15 hours a day. <laughs> so. And you still get to do the fun stuff like this. Yes. Great stuff. Thanks to both the panelists. And thank you for the good questions.